In three, two, one. All right. Hello, action. everyone. Action tonight. Three, two, one. Action. action. I have a very special guest tonight. Really slowly. I conned um, Herman into coming on with me tonight. And seriously, everyone likes it when you come more than when I just do it alone. Because they like all of your Herman-isms. There's a few of those. Yeah. I was told I should write them all down because there's a few. What are they? Uh, I really don't. They just sort of come when. Like lovey dovey. That, yeah. Scrambled eggs. Okay. <laughs> no, but you are a really good teacher and you have a good way of explaining things. And I also, we need to do some videos where you like get off and like mime the horses because that is. Oh, hilarious. and I'm walking the lines. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. They, down in Brentwood, they, uh, They've got a couple on video. They've recorded it, and they look at it later, and they laugh at me. They do? Yeah. I'll see. Mindy's got one. I'll see if I can get it for you. Okay. Okay. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. So I'm doing a free webinar on show season. That's going to be Sunday, May 1st. The link is below, but be sure to sign up and come to that Sunday, May 1st, 12 noon Pacific time. I know a lot of you guys, I asked some questions about like show season. Are you showing? Are you not showing? Let me know if you're planning on showing. Um, but a lot of you guys commented and said that what's kind of holding you back from show season is like nerves or fear of looking bad or that your horse isn't good away from home or you don't know what to do to get ready. So we're going to be talking all about that. What's your advice for show season? Honey. Just have fun. Just have fun. I think, no, I think that's really true because and there's a whole big lecture about um, there seems to be a, a standard nature in nature. We fail 70% of the time. We fail 70% of the time. So birds, it's okay. Hunting birds, too. Even the, the animals that hunt, they only are successful 30% of the time. Yeah. So it, it's. Yeah. I mean, I always say that's how you learn. If you go to a show and you don't, have like the best show ever you learn a lot so that's part of it so come to my webinar um the other thing oh for those of you guys that are in the academy which is like the monthly workshops i do this month we we're talking about how to bond and have fun with your horse and at first i was like i don't know like this is going to be a really hard topic but I've been reading this book, which I highly recommend you all read, called Horse Brain and Human Brain. It's like super fascinating. And it just really goes into like how horses think, how we think, and then how we're actually able to interact with horses. Because if you think about it, like the fact that we can sit on our horse and like teach them tempi changes is just crazy. So I highly recommend this book. And if you're part of the monthly workshops, be sure to come to the lecture on Sunday. Okay, so let's get started. We have a few questions from Patreon members. Um, we have a few new supporters on Patreon. So thank you, Sheila and Lacey. Patreon is just a platform where you can basically leave us a tip for all the free content that we produce. The first question is from Joanna. Where can I find information to rehab my Morgan mare? I've done a lot of walk, a little trot and canter for eight months. I'd like to start under saddle rehab, but need direction so as not to push too hard or too fast. What's your rehab advice? Uh, well, she doesn't say what the injury was, yeah? Yeah, she doesn't. So generally then... Um, when you go back to work in the saddle, it's a couple minutes of the trot. Uh, avoid the corners. I walk the corners, trot the straight lines, and then later you do the and you build on time, and then later you do the same for the canner. Yeah. So lots of straight lines. Um, you want to when you're rehabbing, like the last thing you want to put in is anything lateral, like leg yields or small circles. You really want to avoid that. Again, it always depends on your horse's injury. So you really want to. Kind of defer to what your vet says, but um, it sounds like the horse has had quite a bit of time off. I always, as a general rule of thumb, like however much time your horse has off is how much time it takes right. to get them back to that place. So like if your horse has had eight months off, realistically, it's probably going to take about eight months to get them back to where you, where you left off. Yeah. To where you left uh, off. And then there's 
you know, you always want to make sure the horse isn't all revved up. And it's a tricky thing, rehab. It's very difficult. That's why there's professionals that do it because, you know, how do you work a horse? You know, it's in the stall forever. Now it feels good and it wants to run around and you don't want it running around. Uh, you got to keep the horse safe on well, you too, I guess, but you know, you got to keep the horse safe. And, um, and so, yeah, sometimes you're going to have to use some ACE or something to make sure that the horse doesn't rough run off because he feels good and then re-injure himself. And that, that's a tricky one there. Yes. Rehab is hard. Okay. Next question from Patreon member is Jenny. And she says, this is another kind of rehab question. Um, what to do when your horse after a long winter has lost his canner? He's a bit lazy, but can quite easily get rapid and connected in the trot. But he doesn't carry himself in the canner. From the walk, he takes the canner aid, canners two or three strides and breaks off. When I give the aid from the trot, he raises his head, hollows his back and trots faster. This is quite accomplished all around horse a school master competed at medium level i'm quite experienced amateur rider and canner used to be my strong suit this is a bit tough on my self-esteem so how do we build up his back and his hind end do you have any thoughts transitions and then more transitions and then when you're done with transitions make some more transitions um and yeah. not only transitions out of the gate but transitions within the gate yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think like, you know, since the trot's pretty good, do a lot of like trot, walk, trot, forward trot, collected trot, try to like really make the trot honest. And then, you know, it's just like yourself getting back into shape. Like, you know, the horse has a good canner. It used to be good. And since he's had a chunk of time off, it's going to take time to develop that strength again. And some horses just lose it differently than others. Like for some horses, you know, the trot's harder for some horses, the canner's harder, but I think it's like, you know, it's there. So you just have to ask for it like in intervals and, um, you know, expect a little more canner every time. And then eventually it, it will come back. It will get better. So you'll get there. Okay. Next um, question is from Kathy. So walking on the long side and from the quarter line to the track in haunches into the right. So haunches into the right goes great. Trying to trot the same pattern is broken and I can't do it. Flattens straight, loses bend and can't travel forward. Suggestions to fix it. We keep going back to the walk. Walk and trot haunches into the left is good suggestions head to the wall leg yield the, the wall help you make your half halt uh and so then your reins can stay lighter and then you move them off of that leg yeah and then turn it i mean and if that feels good then you can turn it into actually haunches in but i would i would be doing head to the wall leg yield yeah um that way it's not about how strong you're going to be and whatever you just, the wall helps the half halt get off the outside well it's your inside leg really but outside the arena and down you go yeah that's a good idea. So head to the wall leg yield is basically where you're going at like a 40 degree, 45, 30, 30? 33 degrees, 45 is too much, 33 degree angle. Oh, I always say 45. That's I'm lot. wrong. Okay. 33 degrees. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to the wall. Um, and the wall helps to kind of give you that physical boundary, but the, so is haunches in then 33 degrees? Haunches in is on four tracks. So it's not about degree. Right. Because there's bend in that. It's not an angle because it's straight and then the bend comes behind you. So the haunches in is on four tracks. Okay. Shoulder in is on three tracks. And then the leg yield is from the wall, 33 degree angle. Because if you do more than that, then it gets too difficult. Okay. So yeah, leg yield with head to the wall. And then once you have that, you can change the bend to create haunches in. Um Another thing that you can do is lots of like small circles. So do like haunches in. And then when you lose the bend, make a 10 or an eight meter circle and then haunches in again. And then another 10 or an eight meter circle and then haunches in again. I think that's a, a good one. But haunches in is hard. I feel like um, a lot of times horses can do it well one way and the other way, it just like, it just feels so awkward. And it's just something that you just have to keep 
practicing. I mean, so I remember not the same from one side to the other. Right. So if you're not good on the same side that your horse isn't good, then that's just really not good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember like when I first was learning haunches in, like just feeling like it was like the most awkward. Like I was like, why do we even do this? Like this just feels terrible because <laughs> it's, it's an awkward movement until you feel that it's right. Uh, the other way to think about the head to the wall leg yield, and it's not technically it's different, but you could just think about it as counter shoulder in. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay. Um, this is an interesting question. Donna, do you have videos that can show when a horse is collected or not? I'm trying to see a visual to know what the difference is. That's a that's an interesting question. I think that everything in dressage, like I was thinking about this, like, how did I become a good teacher? How do you develop your eye? Like to see that, like, how do you see collection? And I think when I'm looking at a horse that's collected, of course, it's about uphill balance, like that the withers are higher than the, the haunches. That's part of it. Um, I also look for a lot how the horse maneuvers through corners or through turns, because when your horse is collected, it allows you to maneuver better through a corner and through a turn. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, then again, in collection, there's a range, right? This a horse that's collected for second level is not the same collection that the horse is for Grand Prix. Yeah. So if, if you can get to a horse show and watch the different levels and you watch some good riding and some bad riding, and you'll see. So a horse, you know, generally is nine foot long and, you know, you're trying to make it six foot long. Uh, and somewhere in between there is, you know, second to Grand Prix. Now, if you look at a hunter horse, there are all kinds of strung out. Not, I mean, in our world, they're on the forehand. They're not falling down. They take jumps. There's a different kind of balance there. But if you look at a hunter horse and then you look at a Grand Prix horse, you will see the collection. And then you just got to realize that at second level, it's not the same as the FEI. Yeah. But it's also, I think it's a little bit deceiving because some horses, like, just, are short couple. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, there's, the right, there's a confirmation of the horse. And yeah, a horse that's short couple just standing in the stall is collected. collected. So right. yeah, there's that part too. Yeah, but so a horse that like that is more compact isn't necessarily collected because another component of collection is activity and like shorter, higher steps. So like a horse that's like really compact but they're like, don't have any energy in them and they're not moving and you, like they don't have the activity, then that's not collection either. Right. This is a horse squished together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. Um, how do you assess what intensity of exercise to do to maintain an older horse while ensuring you're not pushing too hard? Do you have progressive steps to recommend including some kind of checkpoints. My mare works about second level, um, third level. She seems to struggle with soundness issues when we try to move up despite veterinary and body worker interventions. Um, recommendations? It didn't say how old it is, did it? No, it doesn't say how old. Uh, yeah, well, and it's for all of us, right? You know, 55 isn't 25. And for the horses, you know, <laughs> 15 is not five. So there's that. Um, it's always about moderate exercise, more so as they get older. And um, the checkpoints are that, right? So you start in a rider and you feel she's getting a little, that leg starting to drag or whatever. You ease back for a couple of days or a week. You've, it's just about modifying the exercises um, in terms of duration, yeah. right? They're probably okay for 20 minutes. They're not going to make 40 minutes or, any, or maybe it's good for 30 minutes and maybe 30 minutes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday and light days, Tuesday, Wednesday. I mean, you can't yeah. do clinic riding every day. And, oh, she says here she's 20. Um, right. So that's, that's getting up there. Yeah. But I think like, I think with older horses that, and like with all of our horses in dressage, that there's like you have to be careful about over practicing certain movements. Yeah, so absolutely. like medium trot and extended trot, 
yep. are really hard on your horse. So you don't want to practice that a lot. Same thing with like really steep half passes. Like I, Yo Hinneman came up and he taught me with Harvey and we pushed the half passes kind of hard. And he's like, listen, like those are really hard on your horse's tendons and ligaments. So you don't want to push them that hard every day in the half passes. You need to work more like transitions are a really good thing that aren't going to be so hard on an older horse, like even walk, halt, walk, rain back, walk pirouettes. Those are exercises that aren't a lot of wear and tear on your horse. But if you have like a 20 year old horse, like you're not going to be practicing a lot of medium and extended trot because that's going to cause your horse to break down. But for sure, like we have a few horses that are like in like 23, 24 that are still going, but it's a lot of walking, um, a lot of warm up time, more breaks, and then just, you know, not pushing them as hard because you can still learn a lot and you can still focus on your position and like do a lot at the walk, but you're not going to be doing, you know, like steep half passes and extended. Right. Top. It's not so much about the tricks. Uh, it's really just getting the horse in that frame and that balance. And I'm a big fan of serpentines and serpentines and more serpentines because then you can really get the horse more supple. Yeah. Serpentines, but just not too tight because again, like the tighter that you turn, um, that's hard on your horse. But I definitely think like for older horses, keeping them moving and keeping them like going consistently is good because once you i mean it's just like us right once yeah. you stop Use moving like, you're done yeah so um so yeah definitely. so yeah well, even when she you, you just you just want to back off the work when she's not feeling a great you don't you don't want to stop the work just yeah. want to ease up on the work yeah Okay. Um, next question is from Sam in Australia. When is the best time to start flying changes? My last horse took three years to get it. I'm two levels away, probably two to three years from having to do them in a test. I have trouble picking a good time because I don't want to cause issues for my current level tests. What are your top three <laughs> tips for starting changes? Yeah, right. As soon as you start doing your changes, your counter cannon is going out the window for a little while. That's, yeah, until yeah. the horse figures that out. So, um, uh, grin and bear it, really. If, you, if you're really that concerned about, you know, your counter canner, then, then hold off on the changes. Um, but you really don't want to wait too long because then the horse yeah. goes, I never make changes. Um, I tend to do it sooner rather than later. As long as I can get a counter canner and do walk canner transitions, I'm ready to start. Yeah. So you need to be able to do like canner walk, counter canner walk, canner walk, counter canner walk. Like that has to be really solid. Your simple changes before you do your flying changes, because a flying change is basically a simple change, except for you don't walk. You just ask just for the other canner lead. Um, and then you know, you want your horse to be able to collect a little bit in the canner, but yeah, for sure. If you wait too long, then it just gets harder and harder. Right, because the horse is older and doesn't understand that you want to make changes. And so if you have a show coming up, then don't practice the changes, right? If you're cut, if you practicing changes or whatever, oh, I'm going to show in two weeks. Well, then don't do the changes. Just go with the counter canner there for a couple of weeks, get to your show, show's over, get back to the changes. Yes. Good. Okay. We have a few questions here from YouTube. So Dana says, thank you for this opportunity. How do I begin to influence a more proper canner? How do I keep, um, keep the canner in a correct frame? That's. So the first thing my, I'm already thinking, right. You want to make sure that you're following on the up stroke, not on the down stroke. Right? Yeah. Right. There's, there's when the up, name comes up. That's you want to go there and then, yeah. uh, and then go there. And so you really get the jump into the cannon. You get the throughness and it's, it really just starts right there. Yeah. Yeah. Because the canner is like, like in the walk and the trot, the horse's back basically stays horizontal like this in the canner. It's like riding a wave. Like there's up, flat down, like up, flat down. And you always want to accentuate the up part of the canner. That's when the horse's mane flies up. That's what we call beat one of the canner. 
So whether you're riding a half halt or pushing the horse forward, you always want to influence it on that upbeat. Um, another thing that I always think is important is like, if you're having a lot of trouble with your canter, like if your horse is crooked or your horse is above the bit or your horse is on the forehand, you need to go back to the trot and try to fix it in the trot and then carry it into the canter because it's hard to fix straightness or balance or roundness in the canter. You kind of have to get it in the trot and then carry it up into the canter. And that's one thing that I've um, observed from like watching all of your guys's videos. Um, for those of you guys that are part of the courses, we're, we've been doing office hours where you guys have been sending me like tons of videos, which is great because I can see more the level that you are, what you're working on. And that's been a big thing is like, if you're struggling with your canner, fix it at the trot and then carry it into the canner. Okay. Um, this is maybe going to be a controversial um, question. More of a trainer question from Cassidy. How do you handle clients that believe they know how to train their horses, yet they are in training with you, but struggle with respecting your opinions as their trainer? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble now. Um... <laughs> Careful what you say. <laughs> I, I'm a big believer in uh, experience. Uh, I think pe some people just need to learn by experience. Um, I've been accused of baiting people because they've told me that they can or they and I'm holding them back or whatever. I'm like, well, then go ahead. And I yeah. let them. And it hasn't always turned out well for them. Yeah. I think I've said enough there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fine line because it's it's always hard, like when you're training someone else's horse, that that you do have to have like some respect for the fact that it is their horse. And like you say it all the time, like everyone enjoys their horse differently. Yeah, horses make people happy in a variety of ways. Right. That's for sure. And, and so like for me with my horses, like I really want to train Grand Prix horses. And I want like to compete internationally. Like that's my goal. But for some of my clients with their horses, their goal is just that they want to have a horse that's safe, that's enjoyable. They don't want their horse like to be pushed as hard because that's just not their goal. So I think it's really important when you have a client that you kind of sit down and have a conversation about what are your goals for this horse? What do you expect out of this relationship? And then are those goals realistic? Because a lot of times I think that tension comes from, you know, like when the client would like to be riding the horse, but the horse isn't really suitable for them. Um, in which case you as the trainer have to say, listen, like, like you would, you're just like, well, good luck. Try riding it. Um, I'm a little more like protective. Like I feel like I have an obligation as the trainer to keep my client safe. And I'm going to say to them, like, listen, it, it's not safe for you to ride um, the horse at this point. Um, so I don't know, but it, it's a hard, it's a hard situation. And at the end of the day, I think that you, with your horse, you have to trust your trainer. Like you have to have respect and confidence in your trainer and if you don't find then another trainer. find another trainer because you know, if you don't like the way i'm doing it with that well yeah because you're not going to really change how someone is like riding or how they're training i think that like if you're the owner that you can have like a gentle conversation and maybe be like hey you know these are the goals for my horse what do you think how can we approach this or another good way to do is like to offer to pay for your trainer to have a lesson because like with another instructor, because sometimes I think that, you know, you just get frustrated sometimes training on your own and you need help. But, um, but yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard situation for sure. Okay. Moving on. Uh, Cassidy has another question. Any tips for training the second trot or show trot with a horse that has a good walk in canter, but a somewhat flat trot? So, yeah. That'd be you. Would you Me. Because you did that with um, a Catalina. Catalina. Yeah. So it takes a lot of time and like kind of training to really get that expression in a horse. 
Um, I usually start by teaching them a little bit the half steps because like if the trot is the one gait that you can really change. Like I had this mare Catalina and her like normal trot was very normal. She like trotted like a pony. And by the time she got to be a Grand Prix horse, she had like this really, really amazing second trot that looked nothing like her original trot. What started with her was I worked with a guy named Morton Thompson and um, he actually t- trains um, Jessica Van Brindle now, the, the double gold medalist. So needless to say, he doesn't come here and train me anymore. <laughs> yeah, we haven't seen him in quite some time. No. But anyways, so with Catalina, we started out by teaching her to lift her front leg and like lift her shoulder more because she would always kind of like go around and be really tight in her shoulders. So we actually started out teaching her to lift her shoulders. Then we taught that's her. That's work. Yeah, that's from the ground. Work. Then we taught her a little bit um, pee off. And then we, from there, we developed the passage. And so the second trot is basically like a trot that's between passage and medium trot. So you know how like when you go to the medium trot and you get that suspension, taking that suspension and then collecting it a little bit back into your trot is how you develop the second trot. But it takes like a long time. It's for Catalina, it took like several years to really get to where I could carry that trot through a test, like through the lateral work and the circles and the patterns. Because at first you can get it on a straight line, like you can get this huge fancy trot going straight. But the second you try to turn or go sideways, Oosh. yeah, <laughs> it, it goes away. So. But anyway, so the short version, it's a lot of in-hand work and you then you train the, the mechanics of it. Yeah. And then once you get the mechanics down, then you start to try and ride it. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Matias says, I'm going to my first dressage show ever on Saturday. Yay. Any tips? Um, yeah, come Leave to, early. Come to my <laughs> webinar. May 1st. Isn't May 1st like May Day or something? I don't know. No. Yeah, it's like May Day. Let me know in the chat if you guys think there's such a thing as, as May, May Day. Day? There is. May 1st is like May Day. It's like May Day is what people call when they're sinking on a boat. No. They're like May 1st is called like May Day. It's like the beginning of like spring and summer and you like give flowers or something. Bring around the posies. Okay. I hope someone on faith. Look, Donna says Maypole. There is such a thing as May Day. There has to be. I think that you, yeah, you like bring flowers or like, yes, it's May Day. Okay, so on May Day, I'm going to be doing a webinar on getting ready for show season. <laughs> See, everyone says, yes, May Day exists. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't born here. I don't know. Was it in my family? <laughs> but no, Herman <laughs> just thinks so. Herman has a sailboat. And um, <laughs> he's Can always we just thinking... <laughs> answer the questions? Can we... Let's go back to the show question. No, okay. So like a few years ago, he always wants me to go sailing with him on his boat. It's like his dream that I take one weekend off during the summer to go sailing. And like, inevitably either the boat breaks down or like the weather's terrible. The weather's terrible. Or last year, my groom quit like the day before we were supposed to go. So um, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. But anyways, the last time that we went out, if you guys go on my YouTube channel, search for we got rescued because i did like this video where we went out sailing the motor died and the boat had to come and rescue us there was no way if we could have never mind so You're leave blushing. early the one yeah i'm not sure i am the the biggest thing for me when i go to a show is i don't like to feel rushed um and then because then everything's frantic and i can't think everything that i need to do so for me, the biggest thing is to leave early and give myself a lot of time to do everything. I can always walk my horse around if I'm in the saddle too soon, which has happened more often than not. But um, it, it just it gives me some comfort to not be rushing around. Yes, leave early. Remember to smile. I think it's important too when you go to the show that you like follow the same format and the same routine that you have at home and also realize that like Herman said earlier, like 70 times, 70% of the time you fail, it's not going to be perfect. And like you, 
you just have to go in knowing that. And like, like, I don't think that, that there's such thing, like no one's gotten a hundred percent, like it's not going to be perfect. And we have such this high standard of like, that everything has to be perfect. And the more that you have that um, standard, the worse it goes. So just, you know, lower your standards and enjoy it a little bit more. I think it's really important. What other questions do we have? Let's see. Um, Tanya, restarting a thoroughbred I just rescued. Besides using a long rein, encouraging him to move forward from his hind end to front and sideways leg, which I have started, what would you recommend as something important? Uh, lunging. Yes. Lunging side reins and already before you get on, already start with the horse understanding, you know, going into contact and giving to that contact. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's a racehorse. And, uh, and racehorses go faster because they take more contact. That's the aid to go on a racehorse is yeah. to take more rain. And so you have to reschool all that and, uh, it, you, you know, in keeping it safe for the horse so that it doesn't think that you're a problem. I would do a lot of that on, you know, start with the side reins long, make sure the horse is going and, da, 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 and then you make them a little shorter. And then you already start creating what we were talking about earlier, a rounder horse, a more collected horse on the lunge line. Yeah. And it I think it makes it just so much more simple for the horse. Yeah. And um, I think also one thing that I think is really important, which you don't do as much is like really teaching the horse to bend and yield the hindquarters. Oh, from the ground. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like Kareem said, my groundwork masterclass. So I do have a, a groundwork masterclass. I go through like, like I would do a ton of groundwork, teach the horse to bend, yield, teach the horse. Basically you, you can teach the horse all of the aids from the ground. You can teach them how to accept the bit. You can teach them how to accept the leg. You can teach all of that from the ground. And it's, it's really important to do that, especially with a, an off the track thoroughbred, because all they know is, is to go. go fast. You're going to introduce that horse to the rest of his body. Yeah, exactly. So anyways, what else did I want to tell you guys? Oh, one thing that is cool is um, my trainer, Yo Hinneman, he came up and he gave me, how many lessons did I get? Like five, five. lessons. Yesterday, which, today. Yeah, yeah, which was awesome. But um, Mr. Hinneman, he's like an old German master trainer. And the wealth of knowledge that he has is like insane. Like he knows so much about dressage. And I really love his lessons because he always talks a lot about the theory of dressage. Um, and so like today he was, we were working with my horse Kensington and Kensington is like one of those horses that's like short coupled, but it's like hard to get him supple and it's hard to get him bending. And so he was talking about suppling or what did he say? It was like suppling and straightening exercises. Bending and straightening exercises. Yeah. Bending and straightening exercises, which is so important that you know, if you think about the training scale, suppleness comes before straightness. And so like, you really want to get your horse supple and bendable in order to make them straight. Straightness is not just about like going straight. And he was saying how there's like a specific word in German, like German has way better vocabulary for this, for dressage. In English, we don't have the right words to describe these things. And that's how come he came back with bending and straightening exercise. Yeah. We have one word for that. <laughs> yeah. So um, so that was really interesting. And then also just this idea of relative straightness. So do you want to explain relative straightness? You love this stuff. So the horse is wider behind than he is in the front. And so when we're going straight down the wall, we're not really because we have the shoulders over the inside hind leg. So the outside shoulder, there's a bit of a gap between that shoulder and the rail and that there isn't a gap between the outside hind leg and the rail because that's what makes it look straight because it's relative straightness. I need to draw a picture. But relative straightness also, I was thinking of it actually on a, like a circle line. Like what is straightness on a circle? Oh, the alignment, the poles in front of the shoulder, the shoulders in front of the haunches. So on a, the horse is still straight on a curve line. Yeah. The hind legs are following in the path of the front legs. That's the leg part. 
but the, that the horse's spine, even with a curve, follows the line yeah. of travel. So like if you were in a drone, you know, well, we did the drone thing and you, you did that do trace. That again. Yeah, you yeah. did that. And so then if there's the circle, the horse's spine is just on that circle and there's no deviation between the horse's spine and the line that is that circle. Right. And a lot of times horses, they don't want to bend in their body. So At least to one side. Right. So they're like swing their butt out or fall in with their shoulder. Um, so anyways, the other thing that um, Mr. Hinneman told me today, which I haven't told you that, but it's so interesting, is you remember Ula Sal Salzburg. Salzburger and yeah. Rusty. So he was telling me he trained them. And he was telling me that when that Rusty like didn't have the best Piaf. And one thing that I love about Hinneman is that he's like really about like every horse, right. Has certain strengths and certain weaknesses. There's no horse that like it's is perfect. perfect. No horse no is perfect getting, riders, no perfect yeah, getting a 10 for everything. So for all of us, no matter what level you are, it's really important that you kind of look at your horse's strengths and your horse's weaknesses and then try to make the good things as good as possible. And like, improve. and then not lose points on the other stuff. Right. Because like, if your horse has a crappy walk, like Harvey's walk isn't great. Or if your horse has like not the best pee off, then you have to make everything else higher points. So with, um, with Ula and Rusty, the PF wasn't great. And so he was like, okay, we're going to make the half passes really, really good because the horse had like, a, I don't remember him that well, but apparently he had a pretty good trot. And so what they started doing was really working on developing expression in the half passes. And he got the half passes to go from getting a score of a six to a 10 by putting expression in the half passes. And I think it was like, one of the first horses that actually carried like loft and suspension in the half passes. And I kind of joked with Hinneman and I was like, so you're telling me you invented expression in the half passes and he just smiled. <laughs> so, and uh, and they, they, they let that horse travel a little bit in the Piaf. In the Piaf. Yeah. So he would get, you know, and you get your safe six. And, yeah. Uh, that was before the half marks. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it's just like, like having um, Mr. Hinneman, having a mentor like that is is so cool it, because he knows so much and he, there's like so much history of dressage because dressage has changed so much. If you go back and you look at old videos. And what was good then is right. we don't do anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's insane over the last couple hundred years, like how much the horses, the quality of everything has like has changed. It's just like you think about what's it going to be in another 200 years. Or 50, really. Yeah, I or mean, 50. With, since World War II, it's changed dramatically. Yeah, it's crazy. So anyways, that was fun. Thank you for coming on. It's always nice when you come on. The last time you came on, I think we forgot to turn off the video. Yeah, no, we got seven phone calls. Yeah, was... yeah we got like seven phone calls because we forgot to switch it off. And um, it's a good thing. I was telling Herman that we have our new house because in our old house, like my closet was right there. And so I'd always like undress and go take a shower right after this. So it's a good thing that we're in our new house. Or if we just turn this thing off. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, um, thank you guys all for being here. It's always fun to chat with you and especially when I have company. So I'm not just talking to a screen all by myself. And you've gotten so much better. When we first did these, you'd get so nervous. Yeah, it's so weird. You can't read the room. You yeah. don't know if you're making a point, if they understand. I know. It's just... It is. Yeah, I feel that way sometimes when I do like presentations like i wish i could all see you guys and like you know like if the eyes are glazing yeah. over if they're like yeah okay i got it you know yeah so give me a different picture i'm not getting that one <laughs> whatever anyways we do the best we can one day joellen's organizing for the world cup in um omaha 20 like 2024 or something. She, she already is like getting us a bank of seats and like hotels. And she talked to the people that are organizing it. So um, that would be fun. Maybe at the world cup, we can do some live interviews or something. That'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. So we'll anyways, see how that turns out. We're going to go have dinner. Good night, everyone. Bye now.
I don't know what is May Day. Is May Day a thing, really? It is. They were saying. 